Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video, although I've already been told by people waiting for this that this is not on my ATP Geopolitics channel, it's on my Atippling Philosopher channel. So I can't even get that right today. There's just nothing has gone right this morning. Firstly, I have an esteemed guest on, uh, John Sweeney, John Sweeney, a former BBC investigative journalist, written with a number of different publications. Uh, many of you will know him and know his ubiquitous uh, orange beanie. And he, uh, I, I cocked up the timing because, you know, brains are useless, or at least mine is. Uh, nonetheless, he's been so decent to reschedule, although he's not in the sort of place you'd normally expect him. So, John, thank you so much for being forgiving. And uh, what are you doing in hospital? Uh, uh, they're chopping my leg off, uh, yeah. basically. But I thought I'd, uh, I'd, uh, I'd che uh, check in with you. Okay, they're not dropping my leg off. Uh, Saturday night, and this is what's so annoying, Jonathan, is on my way to the pub, having um, spent Friday driving to Chernihiv uh, with two pals, the not that caddish at all, uh, James Hewitt, formerly Major James Hewitt, um, and uh, John Chief uh, Lawler, who both um, uh, are doing something for the MAD Foundation. We were delivering a whole bunch of humanitarian aid uh, to um, uh, to a charitable outfit uh, run by a lady called Olga, um, the Romina Foundation in Chernihiv. And I actually carried the, uh, the crutches. <laughs> and now I bloody need one. So what happened Saturday? Having done our good work, uh, um, we arranged to meet down the boozer. John's a Newcastle United fan, watching. He uh, was going to watch the Newcastle Manchester United game. I, so I, you know, I'm going to the pub. I walked down the hill, Michaelife Street, which leads to my dam. There's a pub called Sondok, Sonduk, and uh, there is just awful black ice. And I hit it, and I go flying, and I land on my back, and I. Uh, uh, I had actually, the doctors here are wonderful, but I, I had an ultra, um, an MRI scan um, uh, last night, which shows that the basically the uh, one of my tendons from my knee has been torn from the patella. So what they're going to do is um, um, stitch that back on, suture it back on. Um, so, but for the moment, um, anyway, last when it happened Saturday, I couldn't. I couldn't walk, um, and a, a really an angel, a really ridiculously beautiful uh, Ukrainian woman came and started to pick me up, and I'm 16, 17 stone, so that didn't work. And then her bloke uh, came up shortly afterwards, and he almost fell over, and the two of them are sliding on this bloody black ice on the pavement. And then two more chaps who are more my size uh, come along, and the four of them managed to get me up and then we walk down the road, and then we get to the pub, and um, you know James has gone. Oh, Sweeney, why are you showing off now? <laughs> but but they can see actually I cannot if I I cannot walk anymore. Uh, so because uh, my leg's gone, it's the moment I put any weight on it, I crumple. So um, fixer, one of my lovely fixers, Sasha, uh, called me an ambulance. She came with me. And then I'm then very quickly word is right. So when I got my MRI scan, the um, the lady who's doing it, a young uh, scientist, I'm calling her a lady, she's a smart scientist who happens to be a woman, but she understands that I'm the guy who's written the book Killer in the Kremlin, and I do these videos, I've been on uh, Ukrainian media, so she wants a selfie with me afterwards. <laughs> so that's seriously cool. Um, my screen's gone funny. I don't know why. Uh, I've, I've, I'm sharing uh, with oh, the audience oh, the yes, killer, in the, killer in the Kremlin, uh, just because you mentioned that. And actually, so, I mean, first of all, I, I hope that the, your injury doesn't get in the way of your indefatigable uh, approach to, you know, communicating. We're going to talk so much, uh, uh, hopefully, about communication of truth and, and disinformation and all that kind of stuff. But I guess place to start would be killing the Kremlin. So, this is a, a absolute must read book and i actually advise people to get the audio book version of it because you read it and i and i love it when authors read their own work because you get a sense of you know the intonation and the sense of being 
you like reading the book to me is a sense of getting inside your mind and and how you know it's just I just think it's more uh, it's it's a really great way of 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 accessing the work that people the people put out. So Kiruna Kremlin is a good introduction to kind of this war in, in, in a sense because you know this is a this is a war prosecuted by a killer and it's killing a lot of people within Ukraine but it but you know that killing is not um not constrained to the borders of Ukraine right so w- what got you interested in Putin and therefore you know in this war and w- why how have you found yourself in Kyiv doing the work that you're doing oh well, thank you very much um for this by the way I don't know if you know but I did uh, drinking at university sorry I I did philosophy at university <laughs> And so uh, the only book I, um, I'm a liberal, uh, the only book I read from cover to cover, I'm thinking, oh, I like that. I agree with that. I agree with every word of it, was um, On Liberty by John Stuart Mill. And so um, it, it's fun. Um, and I'm fascinated by philosophy because it makes, it makes you think about what you know and what you don't know. And actually, this is very, very important for understanding Vladimir Putin and his Russia, his Russia, and their war on us. It's not yeah. just on the brain, it's on us. It starts for me in 2000 when um, I go undercover to Chechnya and I see terrible evidence of the Russian army, or rather the Russian killing machine, using um, weapons banned by war and killing refugee columns, um, columns of refugees, bobbing them. And I interviewed an eight-year-old girl who had been the only survivor of a, of a terrible massacre where the Russian army bombed a refugee convoy and they were having, they had um, white flags on sticks. It was awful. And at the same time, the producer, Carla Garapigi, and this was, I was at The Observer then, and I was doing this film for um, Hard Cash, an independent production company, and we made it for Channel 4's Dispatches. But the producer, Carla Garapigi, said, listen, I'm happy to do this, but we should also, we must also tell the story of the Moscow apartment bombs. And I don't know if your listeners know about this, but essentially in... Um, um, September 99, a series of bombs go off um, in working class blocks of flats. These are not rich targets or any, by any means. Ordinary people are killed, about 300. And Putin, who has just been appointed prime minister by Yeltsin, and Yeltsin at this point is a almost senile, certain alcoholic. And he has got very his polling ratings are terrible who is this guy who's this cheap you know this secret policeman in a cheap suit and then suddenly what happens is he comes on telly and says the chechen terrorists did this and we're going to wipe out these effectively we're going to wipe out these bastards in the, on the bog when they're on the, you know when they're on the toilet but the evidence is overwhelming jonathan mm. The Moscow apartment bombs were a black operation by old name KGB, new name FSB. And a year ago, Putin had been the man in charge of the FSB. And for example, at one point, the the, um, the speaker of the Russian parliament, the Duma, said there'd been a bomb. A bomb had gone off in Volgodonsk. A bomb did go off in Volgodonsk. But three days later, hello. The people who were blamed for doing this were Chechen terrorists. One of the guys who was supposedly did it was alive and well and running around. And um, he um, um, and then he died in a car accident. And then there was another bomb which didn't go off in a place called Ryzen. And what happened was local people in the block of flats saw three people enter the basement and leave something there and it was fishy and everybody was very jumpy because of 
This is after the, the, the two big bombs in Moscow. They call the local cops. The local cops are good. And they, um, um, they send um, a local bomb squad guy to go in and he finds detonators and sacks of hexagon with sugar on them. But hexagon is a military grade explosive. This guy diffuses the bomb, but to be certain, to be safe, there's about 200 people in this block of flats. Everybody leaves at three o'clock in the morning, including an old lady who is near death. Now you don't do this on an exercise. You do this because it was real. The cops now, uh, the, the locals identify three Russian people, one of whom is a woman, blonde with a bob, two Russian men, not Chechen. Chechens are um, they're from the south, they're more swarthy, they look more Mediterranean. These are Russian Russians. The two Russians, that are, they've, got a, they've got a fake number plate, a fake Ryzan number plate. This is where it's all happening. But the it drops one of them drops off and so they've got a bad number plate a moscow on the front rising at the back um on the way out of rising they're stopped by the cops and they flash their fsb cards so the people who planted this bomb fsb agents and a day later the head of the fsb says it was an exercise to test the readiness of the people in Ryzen, the authorities in Ryzen. I believe that's bullshit. Yeah. Two people agree with me. One of them is um, a guy called Yuri Shaka Chicken, and the second is Anna Politivskaya. Yuri Shaka Chicken was a great journalist and an MP. And then one day in 2003, his skin started to fall off and his hair fell out and he died. And when his lover went to see him in the morgue, she couldn't recognize any of the, of the stiffs as being her lover. But there was an old lady there who reminded her of her grandma. And she went up to the guy in charge of the morgue and said, I can't find him, where is he? And he pointed to the grandma. So whatever had happened, to Yura Sheka Chicken was so awful that her lover was unable to recognize his corpse. The working hypothesis of my friend Norman Gombe, who is the professor of uh, theoretical physics um, at Sussex University Emeritus, who helped advise um, or acted for Marina Litvinenko as um, an expert on physics, the death of her husband by, by poisoning. Norman Dombey believes that Sheka Chicken was poisoned with polonium-210. The other person who investigated the Moscow apartment bombs, there were others, but somebody else was shot. A third person was Anna Politivskaya. She was poisoned and then later shot. So, I mean, Lawrence asks here, when, when did the intelligence agencies uh, become aware that Putin had orchestrated the apartment block bombings to start the Second Chechen War? So, you know, when, when was this, uh, you know, uh, uh, common knowledge for, or if, is it common knowledge from our intelligence agencies? Have they said publicly that they think this was a false flag? And of course, the, the other thing to say, and sorry I, you know, to go on, but um, it, this also gives us rationale to the understanding that they are cool with doing false flag operations. So when you see these things happen in the Ukraine war and people say, well, that's a false flag operation, and it isn't always a false flag operation, but there is form for that. Russia have form for that. And so we are justified in thinking that they are uh, perfectly capable of doing false flag operations. But anyway, you, to answer the question, when, when did the intel agencies become aware of it? Um, well, I wrote an article um, in the Observer in March 2000, in which I said um, that Vladimir Putin was a war criminal, and I set out the evidence of the uh, that the Moscow apartment bombs and the Ryzen apartment bomb were were a false false flag operation, and so um, it wasn't in an MI6 report; it was in the pages of a, a, a of one of Britain's great Sunday newspapers. So, um, but also I uh, learned subsequently from Craig Murray, 
who had been the ambassador or even the deputy, he was a senior uh, diplomat before he became ambassador to Uzbekistan. And he can remember reading an MI6 report about this very thing. Uh, obvi there is a real problem though, Jonathan, is because our intelligence services, uh, I'm not a conspiracist, I, I, know, I understand what they do, and I'm glad that they do what they do because they're there to defend us against the KGB, the FSB, the Chinese Public Security Bureau. So I like the fact that they're there. But there is a problem I have with these people in that they live too long. They live too long in the shadows of the Cold War and they're not open about what they know. Now, there's a problem here, and I know this as a journalist, is if you put out everything you know, then the other side might, work out, might well work out how you're working things out and therefore that they get a tactical advantage. But this is a nuanced judgment because it's also important to tell us, the voters in the Western democracies, what they know. And I think the problem is hiding in the shade has a tactical advantage, but is turning out to be a strategic disaster because there are far too many people in the West, right up to Trump, who who are have bought the Kremlin's narrative. We need to fight that in the open and in daylight. It's a really bloody good point there because I think one of my big criticisms of the Biden administration has been that they haven't communicated clearly enough the reasons why it is absolutely obligatory that the US and allies of Ukraine support Ukraine as much as humanly possible. So they've gone through most of the war so far, talking about the moral aspect, but they haven't done enough to talk about. And it's only the last week that you started seeing uh, infographics coming out about the economic benefit to certain areas like Pennsylvania and Arkansas and Texas that are getting influx of, of cash due to the, the construction, the manufacture of, of weapons of war that are going to help <laughs> Ukraine. And so the, the Biden administration needs to clearly um, communicate the moral aspect, of course, and I, I think they've done that, but probably not the geopolitical aspect. And this is this comes from, like you're saying, like knowledge of what your security services know, communicate some of that to the public so the public get on board. The economic rationale and all these reasons so that the American public and politicians who don't know better are armed with the correct reasoning and the correct information, the correct ammunition, in, in a sense, to be able to, to judge this correctly. And at the moment, we don't have American politicians, let alone American public, in the right place to be able to support you know, policies because they just don't know the right stuff. Yes. they. Uh, so the moral argument for um, helping Ukraine to victory. I'm not talking about, you know, for as long as it takes helping U uh, Ukraine defeat the yeah, Russian well fascist said. invaders is, has been well made. But, but actually the, the, the bigger argument for me is one made in my book by, um, um, by a former NATO, um, a former, uh, the advisor to NATO Secretary General on understanding Russia. And this advisor said, we're at war with Russia. We've been at war with Russia for a long time. It isn't a war of things that go bang most of the time, but it is an influence war. And it's mm. all harder to wage. And I, and, and I asked him, um, his name's Connolly, Chris Connolly. I asked Chris, how are we doing at this war? We don't know we're fighting. And he said, badly. So part of my context is, uh, 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 to answering your question is, I'm critical of Western intelligence agencies, MI6, CIA, because they spend too much time in the shade and they need to be more open with us, the voters, mm. so we can see the nature of and the extent and the force and the terrifying dark majesty of the Russian life factory yeah. because it's big and if Ukraine falls and this is a possibility now if Ukraine falls then we're next 
And, and, and I think Putin is waiting for a, a Trump victory. And that's what the bookies are giving him at the moment. It's very, very scary. I am scared. I'm frightened. Um, what we must do is, is uh, be open about our information. And we should act on it. The, the best way of defending the United Kingdom, the United States, the whole of Europe, is to give the tools to the Ukrainians so they can do the job. Right now, there's a story, excuse me. Well, you're absolutely right. I, I, to interject, they, I've been saying the last few days, well, for a very long time, that we need to allow or facilitate or help or whatever Ukraine to win on the battlefield, on on in the, on the terrain with weapons, so that we can win in the in the trenches of the virtual world, in the in, in the battlefields of the information space, because like that's the fight that we're having. But actually, our success is dependent on the fight that the Ukrainians are having. So uh, to win here is it, we need to win there. Yes, uh, to win here we need to win there. Uh, Bob Seeley, who's a, um, a conservative MP for the Isle of Wight. Um, uh, uh, I, no, I can see the Isle of Wight from my house, by the way. But, oh, fantastic. Where, where, where about do you live? So, yeah, I know. I looked at your Wikipedia page. You went to Barton Peveril College in Eastleigh, which is uh, fairly yeah. local. I'm, I'm Fairham. So. Yes. Well, then um, I will. Um, whenever I'm. I'll be, when I get back to Blighty, let's, let's go for a pint. Dan Strait, John. Um, I'll explain why. Yes, because anyway, so Bob Seeley is the Tory MP for the Isle of Wight. I, we disagree about lots of things. Mm. Brexit, for example, yeah. is a big bloody bee. But Bob um, is very smart. He was in, um, in British Army Intelligence or something like this. And he's very, very good on Russia, speaks Russian. Mm. And it's a really brilliant piece in foreign policy in which, um, and you put a link to it afterwards or whatever, but Bob Seeley's piece um, sets out there are two methods of Russia waging conflict against the West. The first is Voina, traditional war. The second is Borba, struggle. And the, the, the mistake that so many Western politicians make is that they, they see the Voina in Ukraine. And if Ukraine doesn't actually win this war, it's okay. But they're forgetting the Borba, the struggle. So the other hand of this is that what, what, what Putin is doing right now, what the Kremlin is doing right now, is reaching out to their useful idiots in the West. They're hoping that Trump wins. And at the moment, the, uh, the Republican Party, which has been effectively captured by Trump and the MAGA movement, are against arming Ukraine. And this is a disaster. Um, well done for finding that, the Russian way of war. It's a brilliant article. I'm going to read that, yeah. Uh, so the... Um, He's also reaching out to Urban, um, who is currently... Uh, so right now what's happening is there is a $60 billion defense package in the States for Ukraine, and that money's been blocked by the Republicans. Mm. Secondly, there is a $50 billion, 50 billion euro, roughly the same... Um, um, it, anyway, 50 billion euros are going to Ukraine from Europe, but no, they're not because they're being blocked by Urban, and there is the new um, uh, uh, leader of um, Slovakia is Fico. He's pro-Russian too. And, um, and the outgoing Polish government are allowing Polish truckers to block the border, the primary border with, 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 um, with Ukraine. The effect of this is, in those lorries that they're blocking, are tourniquets and ammo. There's even a, a patrol boat, which has been... Patrol boat, yeah, I showed that yesterday, yeah. yeah. And it looks like a speedboat or whatever, but actually it's going to go and it will help preserve ships that go to Ukrainian ports and then are loaded with, uh, with grain and that grain goes to the Middle East. So these useful idiots, these truckers, I mean, actually, I'm not in a particularly great state at the moment physically, but I'll, don't worry, I'll get, I'll get back. I'm a bit, a bit like a Ukrainian tractor. I'll get back on the road. But I want to go up to these Polish truckers and say, what the fuck are you doing? What the fuck are you doing? Your brothers next door are fighting an existential war with Russian fascism about something you Polish people know a great deal. And yet you're blocking aid to Ukraine. 
And I want to say the same to the Hungarians and the Slovakians. And, and, you know, what, 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 the Soviet invasion of your countries, the takeover, the brutality, 45 years of misery and, 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 and lives being snuffed out and being, being pathetic, horrible kind of people without any agency because of the Russian secret police, the Soviet secret police, because they know anybody and you, you're letting the Russians get away with it again. What's wrong with you? But all of this, as I'm sure you'd advocate, is a symptom of the success of Putin's disinformation warfare over decades now. And and I, so I got a little down in the last couple of days. I, I'll be perfectly honest with you, John. I, you know, you look at the counteroffensive where that's ended up. You look at the lack. So, so you look at all these things. And I think they're all connected, though. And I'd be really interested in what you think. So first of all is what you say is what's going on in, in Congress, House of Representatives with Mike Johnson and, and other MAGA Republicans attaching the aid to Ukraine bill to the southern border bill. They're not they're not attaching they're, they're not choosing anything else to attach the southern border issue to. It's the Ukraine bill. So what why why that one? And is this that that strangled path from Putin through Tucker Carlson to MAGA Republicans to to Ukraine. And so so there's that issue. So it's not looking good in the States. You look at the rise, and I just wrote a really big article on this recently, the rise of the far right in Europe, which has Putin's fingerprints all over it, right? All over these different countries. And you can talk about Robert Fitzo in Slovakia. You can talk about you know, all these different nations are, are around Europe. Then you can talk about Brexit, and I'm sure you'll have something to say on that with, with uh, Putin's fingerprints on that to some degree. And the fact that we've... we've announced today that's been announced as a 17 billion pound shortfall in the UK defense budget which is so you might I know I've heard you talk about how the GDP is down in the UK due to Brexit blah 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 and if that's connected to 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 us you, you get this idea that all of these things are coming together and then you get the Sahel region of Africa and then you get Myanmar and you get all of these pieces of the jigsaw that have Kremlin fingerprints and Putin's fingerprints of them. And I've got to the point where I think Putin is the single most effective politician the world has seen in living memory, that he has had more effect on places around the world than any other single individual. And you can say that's the FSB and whatever, but I'm getting to a point where I'm slightly worried, to say the least, that we are getting growing support for Putin, even in light of almost two years of a disgusting war. I just don't get it. Well, I do get it, is Russian disinformation. So I think you're right. Um, and I actually haven't thought any, I've ever heard what you've just said, which is that Putin is the most effective politician um, in the world right now. And I think that's true. And what's happened is that he is a cunning intelligence officer. And by the way, I am in favor of the West doing uh, their absolute best to help uh, Ukraine um, win the war because I'm worried to win the traditional war here in Ukraine because I'm worried about the border, the struggle. And what Putin has done is realize that if you manage to sort of get through and sort of push aside things like the rule of law and the traditional um, balances of um, of things like um, uh, uh, the mainstream media, which are properly regulated. If you manage to sweep those aside, then you can get to a lot of people and you can alarm them and frighten them and then somehow weaponize this fear to get them to do what you want. And that's populism. And what Putin is doing is he's, a, he's an engine of chaos, but in mm. particular, he's an ender of populist chaos. And um, actually, by the way, this is in, in a funny way like Stalin, because although the, the rhetoric of the Soviet Union under Stalin was, was kind of like communistic, was left wing, the actual reality of his policies were, was far right, uber nationalistic, that actually, although he was a Georgian, he ran um, the Soviet Union as a Russian enterprise and deliberately set out to murder anybody who would get in the way of that. Ukrainian nationalist, Chechen nationalist, everybody. Uh, and Putin is a far-right actor who has understood that actually there are many people, if 
lied to enough and if um, weaponized will overreact and then start voting in populists. And so what we've got is first uh, Brexit, then Trump. Um, and, then, and then there's a whole bunch of other things going on. By the way, the one, the one piece of good news in all of this is Scottish nationalism. Now, I've got great friends who are members of the Scottish National Party, and, and I don't want to um, say that they're Russian agents. However, it's also true that Sputnik had an office in Edinburgh. And I met a, a lovely and Scottish... Alex Salmond was the former leader of, of uh, SNP, was a Russia, RT, Russia Today um, anchor, or he had a programme yes. on RT. And I had a big row with him because he had to go at me about new, when I was still at the BBC about Newsnight wearing a, um, um, a putting on a Jeremy, a, a kind of Lenin hat on, um, on, um, on Corbyn. So, you know, what are you yes, doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Propaganda. And actually it was just at the, the um you do it this way around the the studio is kind of half circular semi-circular and it it was but corbyn wears that hat the um the circular effect of the graphic uh, accentuated the hat a little bit no big deal but but um alex salmon um, and it's, I think, on YouTube or on my Twitter, but you, you may not be able to find it. But Alex Salmon is a, a, a useful idiot at the Kremlin. You take money from Russia today. If you're on Russia today, you are the Kremlin's useful idiot. He is. So, but th that's a good thing. But the rest of it, I don't know about Myanmar enough, though I have been to Burma. I've actually written a novel about uh, Burma in the Second World War called... Um, uh, uh, Elephant Moon, but never mind, that's neither here nor there. But on the rest of it, I'm genuinely worried about what's happening in the Sahel. It looks as like eight out of the ten coups that have happened there in the last four or five years have been sponsored by the Russians. Now, what I fear is that, that uh, Putin will repeat the, uh, the same trick he pulled off in Syria, which is essentially to side with an evil leader, Bashar al-Assad, um, which um, generates a mass movement of decent people who don't want to, to live in a, in a country led by Assad. They get out, and because they're Muslim, because they're brown, um, they generate an enormous amount of anxiety in traditional Europe. And I, listen, I understand that an, uh, anxiety, and I'm not, uh, I don't want to diss those people en masse, I understand why some people, and also remember that, you know, what's happened pretty much since around about, um, it starts in 1960, but in the last um, 60, 70 years, rich people have got increasingly good at not paying tax and rich organizations. So the amount of money, for example, why are British, um, famous British shops, like um, Marks and Spencers, like John, my beloved John Lewis, why are they struggling? It's because they pay local tax and the opposition Amazon doesn't. I, I pay, literally, I paid more tax than Amazon in 2021. I mean, I don't know what their tax figures were for 2022 and 2023, but Amazon literally paid zero tax in 2021. And that irritates the bejesus out of me. Mm. Anyway. I'm not sure that's right. Amazon would say if there was an Amazon PR man that would say they pay some, they'll pay some VAT, and obviously they pay, um, um, uh, they pay tax on um, on on the wages. They have yeah. to pay uh, some national insurance, so they do pay some tax. But it, it but because of cl uh, clever tax scheming, yeah, most of their profits. What they do is they keep on um, putting their profits back into the business, which makes their business grow bigger and bigger and bigger, but also the profits um, are held in off off Britain, Britain's shores. They're held in places like uh, Liechtenstein and Luxembourg. And this means is that the British taxman gets nothing like what he should be getting. Now, there's a political reason for this in that our politicians have not grappled with that mistake. So an awful lot of working class people who pay PAYE are looking at this and saying, well, this is wrong. At the same time, uh, real wages have, have, have plateaued, they've not gone up or they've gone down. 
and at the same time the number of migrants um, and refugees um, um, is there's a steady stream and this has put pressure on the NHS on the schools and in particular on the cost of housing which of course benefits the rich people who don't really pay uh, effective tax so there is a massive problem with how we pay for our democracies to function which our politicians have not properly addressed and at the same time Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin are weaponizing these anxieties and these fears and they're not there are some basis to these fears but the problem is the fear is far greater than the problem and it certainly doesn't help if people end up doing what the Kremlin wants them to do. I mean, right. perception becomes reality, right? So if you fear something enough, it, it becomes your reality. And it doesn't matter whether that, that's real, real or not objectively. If you feel that and you act on that, then that's functionally the same. And so, you know, as you, as you rightly say, the Kremlin loves to sow confusion and then offer the solution to the confusion or like ride on the waves of confusion to their own kind of ob objectives. And, and that is what's happening in Europe. And, and the, so, the, so the next thing is after the Syrians came to Europe and caused great economic, um, the, sorry, they caused great cultural pressure and, on social, social. cohesion. Mm. Um, for, but if I was Syrian, I would not want to, to fight and die and bash al-Assad's army. I would have done the same thing if I mm. was that age. Of course I would. Um, if I'm African, and then you see that the people who run the country are grossly corrupt, but also in bed, what used to be the Wagner army, now rebranded, but the same thing. These are Russian mercenaries keeping the, Russian dict uh, keeping the African dictators in power, shooting and killing everyone anybody who, who tries to blow a whistle upon them. So next we'll see a wave of African migration from the Sahel. Now there are also perfectly good reasons why, you know, because of global warming, all of this, global warming, of course, the Russians are doing nothing, What's they're doing everything they can in the opposite direction. So um, you're right, I'm very, very worried. I first mm. heard from my friend, Vladimir Polko, who arrested me, and it's in my book, it's a very funny story, he arrested me on day two of the war for being a Russian spy. And I said, do I look like a Russian spy? Anyway, we had an argument. Never argue with a Ukrainian with a loaded machine gun. Uh, but Vlad is, Vlad's a great guy. During COVID, he hitchhiked from Kiev to Lusaka and Zambia. He's that kind of guy, right? So when I asked him this summer, how are things going at the front? Because he's in Ukrainian Special Forces. He said, bad. It's a bad job. It's bad. And that was the first time. And I, I keep on, and it was only this, um, my last trip here, when I arrived in um, October, that I, I um, late October, I said, um, this is stalemate. It feels like stalemate here. And um, people criticized me for being too pessimistic. And then uh, Zelensky, President Zelensky said that, and then Zelushny used the same word in um, yeah. an article in The Economist. Now, Tim Snyder, the American philosopher and historian, has said, um, and he's right, stalemate's the wrong word because the Americans could put six new queens on the battlefield straight away if there was the American will to do that. But the problem is there isn't. And the reason for that is in part because Russian bots and Russian dark money helped Trump get into office and, is, and Russian dark money and Russian bots are helping Trump as we speak right now. And, and essentially, um, the West is a victim of a Russian lying machine of this Russian struggle, Boba, Boba. And this means that, that, that we are losing grip on reality. Do you, do you think that uh, fears of escalation are still prevalent in American behaviour? Or, or of those red lines now, we understand that they've been crossed and nothing's happened, so actually escalation isn't a thing. Do you think it is... I mean, are, are there... So it, I agree with you on Trump completely, um, but are the Biden's Democrats or the, you know, the Biden administration is in charge and they could still 
provide things more quickly than they have been doing. So is there something else as well that's going on? So within the America, you've got a um, um, Trump is Moscow's man. Biden isn't. But Biden is, um, was a man who was brought up and lived through the whole Cold War and is afraid of nuclear escalation leading to nuclear war. And I think his fear is misplaced. But this has been the governing factor in his policy. And the problem is traditionally you would find the Republicans who are actually saying, no, we've got to spend more money on defense. We've got to do more. And actually what's happened is that the... Um, uh, that there has been no pressure on the Democrats to do better. When there was cross, when there was cross party approval for spending money on Ukraine, what happened was that Biden uh, slow walked it. So the Biden Pentagon has drip fed aid to Ukraine. Now the Republicans have said, "Nah, uh, we spent too much. Uh, we're bored now. We don't want to spend any more." And the problem is that that Biden has been too slow. So there isn't the Ukrainians don't have enough stuff. But what's also changing is that everybody's watching what's happening here. Because the West have proved to be fickle allies to Ukraine, never mind the rhetoric, what about the delivery? Because we've been proved to be fickle allies and the Chinese are watching, the Chinese are sending an incredible amount of drones. One of my uh, visitors here is, a, um, a, I think he's a colonel in the Ukrainian army. Like, what's fun about being uh, in a sick bed is I get interesting visitors. And this guy was saying that the, the um, we don't have enough artillery, but right now drones are way more effective. Um, but we're not, um, our generals aren't getting this. They're not understanding what's happening here. A whole new form of warfare is happening here. And much of it is powered by Chinese made drones. The North Koreans are sending old school ammunition. But what's happening is the autocracies, the dictatorships are getting together while the dictatorships in particular Putin is using our democracy against us. He is weaponizing the, the enemies of people who believe in rule of war, uh, the rule of law like Trump against us. Do and, you think and, there's and, genuinely an axis of evil developing then? Yes. I mean, I'm, 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 there's a problem with the historical axis of evil. But just because George, George Bush used the phrase does not mean it's wrong. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's wrong. I actually prefer the axis of bad because it slightly <laughs> differentiates it. But yeah, you know, North Korea, China, Russia, Iran, and their proxies, Hamas, Hezbollah. Let's, by the way, Putin loves an anniversary. When did, when was Anna Politovskaya, his greatest critic in the Russian media, when was he shot dead? Do you know, Jonathan? No. October the 7th. When did Hamas um, stage their massacre um, against the raid right. in Israel? October you know? the 7th. Yeah. What, what date is October the 7th? It's Vladimir Putin's birthday. Interesting. He loves an anniversary. He does. He does love the symbolism of dates. This is true. Uh, interesting. I mean, I wouldn't be able to comment as to whether that was intentional or not. I, I wonder about how much hand the Putin and Kremlin had in the Hamas attack. However, well, irrespective well, of that, it, it has been the biggest blessing to to Putin that he could possibly have asked for. Okay, so. There's a particular thing that happened on October the 7th. Um, and by the way, I am... Um, uh, my friend James Miller, who was a great, um, great, great, great cameraman who taught my kids how to surf, who went, went with me to Chechnya in um, 2000 to film this film. He was shot dead by a member of the Israeli Defence Force in Gaza. I do not, I'm not giving a, um, uh, any kind of um, blank check for the Israeli Defense Force of doing what they're doing in Gaza. It's over the top. Also, at the same time, I hated Corbyn's anti-Semitism. I hated it.
And yeah, because you wrote, you wrote for the Jerusalem Post and then... Uh, the the Jerusalem Chronicle. Jeru uh, Chronicle. Sorry, the Jewish sorry. Chronicle. The Jewish yeah, Chronicle. Jewish Chronicle, yeah. that was it. Sorry, I did, sorry. Yeah. I, I, did, I did because uh, Putin's narrative is that everybody in Ukraine is Nazi. So it struck me as being funny for, for me, who's been the... the uh, 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 there's a, a Russian um, called Yuri Falchinsky who ghosted, helped Marina Litvinenko write a book about her husband and about um, the murder of Litvinenko. I think it's called The Age of Assassination. And Falchinsky saw, I'd written in the Observer that Vladimir Putin was a war criminal. This I wrote this in March 2000. And Yuri said to me, the thing about you, Sweeney, is you were the first one. So it struck me to call Putin a war criminal. So it struck me as being funny, Jonathan, for me to work for the Jewish Chronicle in a in a in a Nazi-run state, and I was very happy to do so, until um, the Jewish Chronicle ran an article. Um, oh gosh, sorry, I'm um, I'm tired, um, and I I found. Um, the nature of the article and the guy who authored it was uh, he's effectively on the far right. Can you remember the guy who wrote the, the piece? No, it's, I can't. But anyway, it's somebody who is more Islamic. Is he? I think he's an, Islam, uh, an Islamophobe. He would say no, no. But anyway, all of this is difficult, all of this is nuanced. But, but essentially, um, the Russian lying factory is using the tensions in our democracies against us to to make hay what's so frustrating about this is if you take the american economy and the european economy and the british economy and put them together we are 25 times stronger and richer than russia and yet russia is on the front foot in the war right now my ukrainian friends are in trouble and and and, and um, biden was wrong to to hesitate to give enough stuff to Ukraine in a timely fashion. And it feels like it's too late now because Russia has got hold of the Republican Party. So Biden isn't fighting Trump. He's fighting Putin. But he's fighting Putin through Trump. And he's finding it hard. And actually, I think that Putin has outfoxed him. The same, and why is our defense budget in a massive pickle? Because of Brexit. Because after Brexit, the city of London said, or rather the money that parks itself in the city of London said, well, this is a bit stupid. And, and, and Dublin, for example, now has higher house prices than London because of Brexit. Small businesses find it impossible or very difficult. They find it difficult to, uh, to export good, you know, brainy, clever stuff because we're good at things in Britain, or we used to be, to Europe because, because of Brexit. And that is meaning that we've got less uh, tax um, in, uh, for the tax man for the Treasury to spend. And so we're in a mess. So Brexit has been a massive, massive success for the Kremlin. It means that we can't, Britain cannot arm the Kremlin properly. I said, and I know this is going to be divisive. There are people on my threads who are very Republican, who are very uh, leave orientated. So, you know, we are a, a broad church here, but like I've, I've publicly debated Brexit before, actually before Brexit and after Brexit. I debated in Bournemouth, <laughs> uh, Brexit and the media and actually the, the importance that the media played. But I, I think it is, it's just a really difficult one to, to win. Sorry, my teacher. Fuck Putin. It's, <laughs> very good i like that you yeah you've got a number of different uh fuck putin t-shirts i think i think that's not the only one I've seen. yes the i've got a, a series of those things um so my friend james Hewitt, who who um uh, looked after me on saturday night he voted for brexit i understand that, but there are natural reasons for good people to vote in this way i feel that there is also it's a goal for the kremlin so, yes and i think so, yeah, objectively, what, what, bad for the British economy. So I think it was a yeah. mistake. But I, what, what, Andrew well, Pierce, I sorry, I like the story, so I'm going to chuck it in. Andrew Pierce from the Daily Mail asked me on LBC when I was in Kiev uh, last year in March, um, where I still am. But anyway, he asked me last March, when are you leaving, John? And I said, Andrew, in 2016 in London, I voted Remain. 
in 2022 in Kyiv, I'm voting Remain. Nice. I like what you did there. I like what you did. What I was going to say is I remember speaking to my father who was, you know, super, super right wing Brexiteer. Um, and I just remember saying to him, look, look, dad, you've got to look around who really wants Brexit to work. And if Putin is one of the main advocates for Brexit to work, you've got to be wondering what's going on here that's below the whole kind of arguments about immigration and arguments about this and that. Let's look under the bonnet here at, at what really are the mechanisms that are taking place. We've got Trump really wants Brexit to work and we've got Putin wants Brexit to work. I think that, that here are people that are wanting advantages for them and not advantages for us. And, and you have to worry when one of your best mates is Putin in this and you know that's yes why yes and so but he's um um exactly 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 but uh but yeah the, uh, but as you say you know the, these these arguments w will will rumble on i mean you, just going back to the idea of disinformation i love the so we haven't talked about uh under under deadly skies which i'm just going to bring it it up now on uh, for the viewers to see. This is done through Bylines TV, and it is a fantastic documentary. It's not massively long. It's an hour long. It's well worth, you know, paying good journalism at Bylines TV to, to watch that through them, I would advise. Uh, go and watch that. It's really good, and it, it's been produced by and, and stars uh, John. Uh, in in that... Uh, not, by the way, when I, when I was wandering around... <laughs> Um, skipping like a spring lamb, I would say, rather than a bloody hospital bed in Keith. <laughs> <laughs> but you included a great Eisenhower quote uh, that I think can I think you you included that in in the documentary right at the end, which I think is uh, pertinent to right now. So Eisenhower said, "Get it on all on record now. Get the films. Get the witnesses. Because somewhere down the track of history, some bastard will get up and say this never happened." And, th and that was so good for the for the for what you were trying to do with that documentary that was a really good good quote but it's it's almost like it's not down the track of history what what the problem we face now is as soon as claims come out right now and even if it's a video claim straight away you get the counter narrative from the kremlin which is oh that was staged or this didn't happen or that's not true and and it's almost like is it like we can still produce this evidence. Like, for example, you have produced a, a documentary that includes interviewing people who have been tortured in a Kherson, you know, prison institution, right? And and I assume that Russian, uh, you know, Kremlin voices will be saying that was a paid actor, that didn't happen. So it's almost like the, there's there's an answer to this Eisenhower issue in the here and now. Yes. Um, I mean, I haven't, um, I haven't bothered to look, but but, but essentially, um, you know that, for example, uh, Tommy Robinson and his goons don't like me, and they have a, uh, they have a go at me uh, wherever I pop up, and so, um, but of course, Tommy Robinson went to Russia. Just to let the international viewers know, Tommy Robinson is a leader in, it's not his real name, but he's a, he's a leader in UK uh, who is now associated with the in English Defence League, which sits on the, the far right of English politics and is more of a kind of populist movement. Uh, he's controversial. A lot of people absolutely love him if you're that way inclined. And a lot of people absolutely hate him if you're not that way inclined. And so that's who John's talking about. <laughs> yes, but but he is adopted. he adopts the... He speaks Kremlin ease. He tells the Kremlin start fairy stories. Now he will say that's because he's a two Brit. But then you've got Marie Le Pen, the same stuff. And then you've got Matteo Salvini, and to an extent Maloney um, in, in Italy, who also peddle the same stuff. So and you've got Trump as well. So what's happening now is that there is it, it, it feels like fascism is on the move, and. Um, the, the the axis of bad is more rather than less fascist and the democracies are in trouble um so um, oh, this is the article i wrote on that it's a, it's a big old long yeah. read it's a 16 minute read stoking division how putin is helping the rise of the right and all the examples of how the far right in in europe have have been on the rise and then the evidence that i've gathered to suggest how yeah. or to show how putin is directly involved in in that rise and uh, i'll i'll put the link to that in the live chat but sorry john carry on uh, so um jonathan i think we we think alike 
It's possible. Are we twins? I, I, do you know what? I was listening to some of your, I listened to your Silicon Curtain interview uh, just to do some research for this. And I was like, do you know what? Everything John is saying is exactly what's in my head. And I don't think we're going to disagree on anything. And oh my God, we just absolutely agree. So I'm up for that what's pint, it? mate. Uh, what's can... your football team? Well, it is Pompey. But so... Ah, 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 ah. We disagree. Yeah. Tramere Rovers. Tramere Rovers. Oh, it's Tramere. all right. I thought you were going to say Southampton. You're all right. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. My favourite line about uh, um, Portsmouth was there was um, when the British uh, Royal Marines got to uh, Unkazir in uh, 2003. There was a guy there, a reporter from Sky, and uh, uh, so this my uh, phone. I'm kill that. Excuse me. There's a reporter from Sky who said, um, um, so how is it? And and the, the British Marines said, hey, you know, all these government ministers are saying Uncas is like Southampton, like it's a port. Well, the people here are, are throwing stones at us. They're shooting at us. It's not like Southampton. It's much more like Portsmouth. <laughs> <laughs> Which Very I, love, nice. way, I do love it. Also, I very much love, and I'm sure we can do this, have a pint of Horndean Special Brew. When I Indeed, look although it's now owned by Fullers of London. Yeah, I know, that's a tragedy. Um, part of, I mean, I'm, I'm a liberal and I'm against um, um, big state and I'm also against big corporations. So, um, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I don't want to knock Fuller's too much, but I liked it when the Horndean special brew was made by Horndean's, the local brewery. Yeah. Good uh, yes. me. Anyway, You're talking like... my language. Yes. Um, so, but we're in trouble. Democracy's in trouble. The line that, uh, Yates, you know, the Yates' line is, is right. You know, the, the best lack all conviction, the worst of all of a passionate intensity. And um, and right now my Ukrainian friends are um, uh, they're suffering horribly. Um, there's a friend of mine um, sent me a video. I've just put it up on my Twitter feed uh, at John Sweeney Raw uh, yesterday, which you can see. And it's a, a film. Um, it's a 30 minute film about trench warfare, and it's called um, Tough Day um, Out East. Um, and it's shot by. Um, Oleg, Oleg um, or Sensov, I've forgotten his first name, Sensov. It's really, really good. And basically, you see a, it's a team of Ukrainian uh, soldiers who are surrounded. And at one point, you can hear Russian tanks go by. Um, and, and they, um, I mean, watch to the end, but, you know, like, bloody hell. So my friends are dying, and I understand what's happening here, and it's grim. Seriously grim. Um, um, moment, I'm on a Zoom. The um, five minutes, yeah. Um, okay. The um, somebody's got to put a drip in me. <laughs> By the way, Ukrainians know who I am. They like my nails. I'm going to be as good as gold here. Um, <laughs> but um, what's happening here is a tragedy, in that so many uh, the flower of Ukrainian youth men and women, mostly men, are being killed and maimed because we have failed to understand what's happened because we've been conned by the Russian life factory. And I guess that, well, this would be my last point then, which is, so in your interview, and again, international viewers won't know this of you, but your your most famous appearance on UK television was doing a, a documentary for the BBC on Scientology, right? It's one of those glorious moments of TV. You can go and check it out on YouTube where John is screaming at the people who've been following him. And I, I vicariously through John, I'm like screaming at them too. It's one of those moments where I'm like, yes, John, I know that it's unprofessional. I know that people might take the mickey out of you for doing this or whatever, but God damn it, man, you are absolutely on point. And he's screaming at these people that have been following him doing the whole fair gaming of Scientology. And I've written plenty of articles on Scientology. But what I like that you do is um, connecting the brainwashing of Scientology, the cults of Scientology, with the brainwashing that's taking place uh, of, of, of people with the Kremlin narrative across the world, not just in, in Russia itself with its domestic population, but people around the world. And we need to be aware of brainwashing. Yes. 
right now, people, uh, vulnerable people, um, are being, um, by which I don't, and this sounds elitist, but it isn't, um, um, because my parents were working class and I understand this stuff. Um, I wasn't born with a silver su uh, spoon in my mouth or anything like it. But if you're, uh, far too many good people are being brainwashed by useful idiots who effectively are peddling the Kremlin's lies. Russia is not a free country. Ukraine is not Nazi. Um, Ukraine needs to defend its borders and we should help them. Absolutely. Because if Ukraine loses and the Russians are coming for us, they're coming for us anyway. And, and that might sound like, oh, that's, uh, you know, you're, that's way too, I know, performative. That's way too dramatic. But actually, they really are. When you think that that fight is taking place in our heads, that, that coming for us is happening at the ballot box. That coming for us is happening at the price of the fuel at the fuel pump. That coming for us is working on so many different levels than just driving a tank towards us. So absolutely that's the right thing to say as far as i'm concerned john um look I, I guess you've got to go and get a get fed with a with a drip um so we'll draw this uh, to to an end sadly because i feel that we could talk forever uh john well, let's uh, do it again let's do it yeah. again what'll be quite fun is uh, to do it in person maybe sometime absolutely so next time you're you're in hampshire uh, you know, shoot, shoot us a message and, and we'll we'll meet up. Uh, people wishing you a speedy recovery. Uh, thanks, Steve does stuff. Hope for a speedy recovery. Have a pint each back in the UK. Thank you very much. So the pint is on me, John, that is for sure. Um, uh, follow the money. There is evidence uh, about loans and payments for political parties. Why did the MI6 and the Fed not, uh, why are they not alarmed by this yet? That's another big question for next time. Uh, yeah, definitely follow the money. I did that big article on uh, Tucker Carlson and the links of Tucker Carlson through his father to Victor Orban. His father is sits on a board of the lobbying company to Victor Orban's, uh, to Victor Orban and his government. So when, when Tucker Carlson is saying stuff on TV or on Twitter or wherever he is, you know that you need to follow the money. And that money goes through Hungary and to Russia. So Tucker Carlson is another one of, as John says, these useful idiots. Um, look, John, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll send you another email. If, if you're up for another chat online like this again, uh, and certainly when, you, when you're back in the UK, uh, can I just apologize wholeheartedly for the cock up this morning, though? No, not at all. So it's a real pleasure, and um, and you'll forgive them for being a Pompey supporter. <laughs> <laughs> of all the evils in the world, that <laughs> young man is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've got to go. Somebody's got to uh, put a prick in me. <laughs> yeah. Take care, John. It's uh, yeah. Uh, there's too many jokes. Uh, take care. All the best, mate. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, uh, thanks so much to uh, John there, who who really kindly agreed to do that and is doing that from his uh, from his hospital bed. Uh, I, I can't thank him enough. And ho hopefully you appreciate that. I know, politically speaking, both myself and John are not uh, going to be to everyone's taste. Right. I know that there are half of you out there that are going to be deeply Republican and deeply uh, leave in terms of Brexit and US politics and whatnot. And but it's always useful to hear the other side of the story. And actually, you know, we need to worry. So like, for me, say, to look at US republicanism, for me, like Reagan republicanism is taking a beating at the moment. And it shouldn't because that should be where republicanism stands. And the kind of MAGA republicanism that has 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 come to the fore over the last six, seven, seven years. 10 years, really, we have to wonder how much of that is covered in the fingerprints of Putin. It, 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 and, and whether it is or isn't, though, like the end result of that with, I would argue, Trump getting in into power again will be to the benefit of Putin nonetheless. So we need to be wary of this. And it, is this is, is this what we want? You know, when you have, say, Nikki Haley on the books against Trump, you know, why is it that Trump is attracting that uh that support in a way that Nikki Haley isn't when to me when you look at particularly when you look at Ukraine I can't speak for the other policy 
points. When you look at Ukraine, she's clearly much more on the money uh, than, than than Trump is. So, yeah, I know that, that this won't be for everybody, but hopefully you appreciated this. Look, uh, I hope to speak to John again. Massive apologies for those who got up really early in the, in the US to, to listen to this. I hope you appreciated uh, John's um, <laughs> points made from his hostel bed. And thanks so much to all of you. Thanks to people like uh, Louise Foley here. Thanks. Bloody great interview. Cheers, mate. Really ap appreciate that. Look, look, it it was something I was really looking forward to as well, but uh, glad that you appreciated it too. Uh, and go and check out Killing the Kremlin from him. It's an absolutely fantastic book. And it is also uh, well worth checking out the documentary he's done through Bylines TV. Thanks so much to Lawrence22, to John Larkin, uh, to Sabarin, to Matt Bishop, that is, to Steve Does Stuff, uh, to Guter Horst, uh, and to Louise as well. Really, really appreciate all your support. Take care, everybody, and uh, I'll be in touch pretty soon.